It's a baffling mystery that has become an obsession. This one, since it's not solved, just captures people. Many believe a killer still walks the streets. Her heart's still pumping the blood out. If we were just a few minutes earlier, maybe we could have avoided this thing. The 40-year search for the Zodiac Killer remains a mystifying cold case. It's an amazing case, you know, and it may never be solved. Thinking to myself, what a monster there's out there. He was the boogeyman. Now, true crime writer Aphrodite Jones reopens the case files and goes looking for new answers. Uh, so let me just ask you straight out, are you the Zodiac Killer or am I just imagining things? And he admits to being the Zodiac. Yes, he does. Got the whole thing on tape. On True Crime with Aphrodite Jones. In a state where bizarre crime seems to be the norm, this case ranks at the top. People don't realize the level of fear which the Zodiac instilled. This man was a terrorist, and a terrorist that was American-grown, way before we ever thought about anybody like Timothy McVeigh or Osama bin Laden. Even though the killer has not been heard from in years, the specter of his deeds still hangs heavy in the air over the San Francisco Bay. He has murdered five innocent victims and claims credit for at least 30 more. On or about August of 2007, for the first time, I saw a composite of the Zodiac Killer. In the spring of 2009, on the steps of the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper building, a press conference is held with yet another new theory on a 40-year-old murder case. Prior to that date, I had no knowledge of the Zodiac Killer, nor anything to do be with the mystery behind his identity. The event draws dozens of reporters and crime aficionados these people want to know, has someone finally solved the case of the Zodiac Killer? Upon seeing the composite, I recognized the individual as my father. Deborah Perez claims that it was her father, Guy Ward Hendrickson, who stalked the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 60s and 70s. She says as a little girl, she would ride with him in his car as he hunted his murder victims. I was a child and I just thought I was helping my dad. I didn't know. She even admits to waiting in the car as he shot his victims, only to return to the vehicle covered in blood with little or no explanation. He had spots on him and he stated that he had stopped and helped someone fix their car and that it was oil. Her story sounds convincing to some. The only problem is, when it comes to claiming the true identity of the Zodiac, she's not the first. BS, I say. No. No. Or the second. There's not just the Zodiac, it's a Zodiac. There's more than one murder. Or the third. In fact, during the last 40 years, hundreds of people have come forward to claim that their fathers, sons, neighbors, and friends are the man known as the Zodiac. If you do any crime reporting at all in San Francisco, and I've done a lot over the years, you get Zodiac theories through your door. We got a new Zodiac theory in, and I got the typical response, was a, which was a rolling of the eyes from my editor, saying, yeah, yeah, when they make an arrest, come talk to me. It has also captured the imagination of best-selling author Aphrodite Jones. This killer who calls himself the Zodiac, is in a league of his own. For so many people, not just the victims and their families, but for people who are armchair detectives or people like myself that are in the crime-solving business, it becomes almost inherited that, my God, after 40 years, we still can't figure out this puzzle. People truly become obsessed to the point that they lose their own sense of focus and purpose in life.
over trying to solve it. It feels incumbent upon me to try to find the answer. In her quest for the truth, Jones will re-examine the case and talk to those who say they know who the killer is. One person who has stepped forward to claim he knows the identity of the Zodiac lives in a remote area of mountains between Sacramento, California and Lake Tahoe. This is the home of Dennis Kaufman, a man who is convinced that his stepfather, who died a few years ago, is beyond a doubt the Zodiac killer. I saw him with my eyes in 1975. We saw him stab a guy right here in Sacramento. When I got to the house where Dennis Kaufman lives, I felt like, oh my God, maybe this is somebody who is grasping at a straw. I've known so many people who want to attach themselves to a name like Zodiac, and maybe he's another one of them. So you develop a theory that your stepfather is the Zodiac. I was visiting my sister, a documentary came on TV about the Zodiac Killer. Uh, they had this composite. Of course, this was the, the famous composite of the Zodiac. Everybody knows this one. This was done by the San Francisco Police Department in 1969. And as I was watching the documentary, my brother-in-law made a comment to me, doesn't that remind you of Jack? And when he did, my hair and my arms stood up. I said, what'd you say? Well, of course, when I put Jack's picture up next to it, you could see the resemblance. And of course, that was the first thing that started me, you know, investigating this thing, you know, was the resemblance. Dennis has compiled over 40 years of revealing evidence that he believes places his stepfather at the center of a story that begins in Vallejo, California on December 20th, 1968. Two high school sweethearts are out for their first date. They are supposed to be heading to a Christmas concert in the center of town. Instead, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen make a detour and drive into the darkness. They are headed for an isolated local lover's lane. This is Betty Lou's first date ever. Though the road is just a few dozen miles from the urban centers of Oakland and San Francisco, it may as well be in the middle of nowhere. And this is exactly what the two want, a place where they can be alone. Faraday drives his mother's Rambler station wagon with Betty Lou close at his side. He parks the car on a gravel stretch of pavement just off the roadway next to an access gate. They listen to the radio. They talk and do what teenagers do. But around 11 p.m., their secret spot is disturbed when another car slowly approaches. A man gets out of the car. He has a gun. And he begins firing into their vehicle. Jensen bails out of the passenger side door. Faraday attempts to follow her. The shooter takes aim and hits Faraday once in the head. It is a lethal wound. Jensen makes a run for it. Again, the killer aims and now fires five times, hitting Jensen each time in the back. She falls dead 28 feet away. The shooter gets in his car and drives off. Minutes later, a local passing by discovers the crime scene and calls police. The cops are baffled. Residents of the small town are stunned and frightened. Who would indiscriminately kill two young people in cold blood? Little do they know at the time, but this is the beginning of a crime spree that will haunt the San Francisco Bay Area and the nation for more than 40 years. Because this is the first murder committed by the man who will go by the name of the Zodiac. Hi. Aphrodite Jones will retrace the steps of this notorious killer. We can go to the crime scene. Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to take a ride over there. Yeah. You want to go right now? Sure. Let's go. Whenever I'm at a crime scene and I know I'm standing in a place where people have been murdered, where it's bloody ground and you almost don't want to walk in those steps, yet at the same time, in order to understand the killer, someone like me needs to grapple with it. 
I need to go there and have the chill to the bone. His name is Pierre Badou, a retired police detective from the Benicia Police Force. He and his partner are the first police officers at the scene of the slaying. Badou drives to the spot where Faraday and Jensen were killed. Are we here? Yeah, we are. It is a place he knows all too well. There's no street lights here. There still isn't. If you come out here at nighttime and look at this place, uh, it is dark, really dark. There was hardly anybody coming by here. If you got a car once an hour, that would probably be a lot. We had just passed here, and there was no one here. You drove yeah. by, you would have seen a car here? Yeah, patrols would always look here, because this was kind of known as a lover's point. And a lot of people didn't know this road. Right. So, you know, you had to be somewhat familiar with this area. So does that lead you to believe that, at least, if nothing else, the Zodiac lived maybe in Vallejo? Oh, I think so. Uh, he lived in the area, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, he knew the area. The victim's car evidently pulled in this way here and was parked heading towards the guardrail. The young man was still in the car. Uh, the young girl, she was almost parallel to this sign and she was laying face down. Until this day, I could still see the bodies laying here. It's something that was really traumatic for me. When it's that real, you know, when it, when it's when you're here, yeah, and those victims are here, and you somebody's drawing chalk around them. You see that they're young kids, and you see the male in the car breathing, and you you look at him, you know, he's gonna expire, or his brain hasn't caught up with his breathing yet, and you see that she is dead, and you know the blood's still fresh. I mean, her heart's still pumping the blood out when we got here. And I was a young detective sergeant then, and uh, it just... It's seared in your brain. Oh, yeah, yeah, it really does. If we were just a few minutes earlier, maybe we could have avoided this thing. It's the 4th of July, 1969, in Vallejo, California, six months since David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were murdered on Lake Herman Road. Another young couple is on a secluded date in Blue Rock Springs Park, when a man approaches and opens fire. But this time, the killer does something different. He drives a short distance away from the crime scene and calls 911. Operator Nancy Slover is on duty. I answered the phone as usual, you know, Vallejo Police Department. Uh, the party on the other end said, I want to report a double murder. If you'll go on Columbus Parkway to the public park, you'll find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9 millimeter Luger. And I also killed those kids last year. When he ended the call, he just said, Goodbye. But as he makes the call, there is something the killer doesn't realize. When police arrive at the scene of the crime, they discover that both victims, Mike Majot and Darlene Farron, are still alive. Even though he is shot multiple times, Majot survives. Darlene is not so lucky. She dies on the way to the hospital. But this time, there are witnesses, or at least people who heard what happened. You were actually on the golf course here in Vallejo. Being kids, we were up drinking wine on top of the golf course green. It was dark. And we heard firecrackers pop, 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 or what we thought was firecrackers. What's running through your mind? Well, actually, we didn't put two and two together until after we pick up the next morning's paper and two people are killed at Block Springs. Must have devastated you still in my mind as a, as a as an adult the whole community was in fear and to this day you know the fear kind of still sits there did you ever go back there after that no you know when it became dark nobody went to blue Ox springs nobody went to lake herman everybody kept kept their doors locked kept everything pretty secure 
Dennis Kaufman remembers his stepfather moving his family all over California, suspiciously close to where the Zodiac found his victims. We moved around too, we never stayed in one place for very long at all. We were always on the run. No matter where we lived or what we did, he always had a truck and camper so we could pick up and leave at any time. Suspected Zodiac murders, they start in 1966 and they go all the way till 1975 and they stop for four years and they start again in 1979. There, there's murders all the way up until the four year gap there. The exact same time we moved to Minnesota, out of state, moved back. One month we moved back to California, one month later, the next one's listed. As I listen to Dennis and his brother talk about this man, Jack Torrance, there was a moment where something clicked for me and I realized, wait a minute, they have so many details about a man and his habits and his bizarre uh, intensity about trying to pinpoint locations and it seemed like it fit the puzzle of who the Zodiac would be and if nothing else at first I realized that they did live with somebody who was a killer that had never been caught. One of the things I remember you told me in our conversation was that Jack said to you at some point here's a gun go out and don't come back unless you killed something. He handed me a 22 rifle he says, you know, we're going to start getting along when you learn how to kill something. He says, don't even come back home until you bring back something dead. The idea that a young kid would be forced to go out and kill prey and bring it back as a pro trophy or prize, that told me something. He wasn't making that up. In July of 1969, three weeks after the attack at Blue Rock Springs, the case takes another unexpected turn when three shocking letters arrive at the San Francisco Chronicle, the San Francisco Examiner, and the Vallejo Times Herald. San Francisco Chronicle reporter Kevin Fagan knows the Zodiac letters well. He'd sent letters saying, announcing that he had killed uh, and he was going to kill again. And he'd send them to the newspaper so he'd get maximum exposure, which is kind of a typical serial killer trait. Included in the envelope was a puzzle, a cryptogram, that if decoded would supposedly give clues to the killer's identity. He threatens to go on a killing rampage if the cryptogram is not published on the Chronicle's front page. The letter closes with a symbol, a symbol that will become this killer's haunting signature and he signed it with the, this freaky little symbol that looked like a telescopic gun sight. The Chronicle published part of the killer's cryptogram on page four, defying his orders. The code was quickly cracked, but it revealed nothing about who the killer was. It only contained ramblings about how he liked to kill and how his victims would become his slaves in the afterlife. In San Francisco, reporter Duffy Jennings worked at the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. If I could be a fly on the wall in that San Francisco newsroom. Everybody was keyed up and everybody was tense. Uh, people were never quite sure where the next event was going to occur. Obviously, it became an ongoing murder mystery. and. You know, everybody loves a, a murder mystery. The problem is this is real. It affected real people and their families. In one of his letters, he did say, while I was having fun with the cop on the phone in Vallejo. After that, I got escorts home every night. I remember looking at the Vallejo Times Herald and looking at the, at the letters that he was writing. And thinking to myself, what a monster there is out there. I mean, he really was the boogeyman, right? He was the boogeyman, yeah. Just one week later, another letter arrives. This time, the killer identifies himself for the first time as the Zodiac. He complains that his cipher did not receive front page coverage. It's a slight that enrages the Zodiac and terrifies everyone else by saying that he will make good on his promise to kill again. July 1969, the small town of Vallejo, California, on the outskirts of San Francisco. 
Terrified local residents never dreamed that their quiet little community would become the focal point of one of the most horrible murder mysteries in California history. An unknown man has shot four people in cold blood and sent several threatening letters to the area's newspapers demanding front page coverage. 40 years later, the killings still haunt Dennis Kaufman each day. He is gathering chilling evidence that he believes proves his stepfather is the Zodiac Killer. It's interesting that Dennis Kaufman has spent a long time trying to convince people that his stepfather was the Zodiac, and so much so that he's devoted his life to it. Um, it's taken over, it's become an obsession. Before I told anybody my theory, I, I went and I did, I researched it for three months to make sure that I wasn't accusing someone that was innocent. Wanted to make sure that I was right. And I was getting the runaround from several law enforcement agencies that I was working with at the time about as to Jack's involvement in the case. So I decided to call him up and just ask him, see what he had to say. I told him I discovered who he was and I wanted to write a book, but I wouldn't publish it until after he's dead. And that's when he agreed to give me all the information and he started telling me stories, just like it was no big deal. I got the whole thing on tape. You got it on tape? Yes. Your Never. conversations with Jack? Yes, I do. And he admits to being the Zodiac? Yes, he does. I'm cutting about his throat lately, so... Okay, well, that's all right. You know, I got the power to do it. I had to find a way to make him feel comfortable while talking to me. He didn't know I went to the police at the time. I had to act like it was no big deal. I had to put myself on his level, if you will, to get him to open up to me. I've been tempted to, you know, see how much I could write down you know, and remember. Right. But, uh, of course, my memory's uh, not like it used to be. Right. And it couldn't be published until after my death. I was thinking my word on that. Most of the things I could deny, they have no proof. Right, it could just be like circumstantial. Yeah, I'm not too worried about it. It's what the people I know would think. Right, right. If it was uh, a known fact that uh, it was me. September 27, 1969, Lake Berryessa, a few miles north of Vallejo, just less than three months after the last murder attributed to the Zodiac. It is here that Celia Shepard and Brian Hartnell, a young college couple, are on a romantic date, alone together, or so they think. When Cecilia sees a man hiding behind a nearby tree, Brian tells her not to worry. The couple are startled as the man approaches holding a gun. Sonoma County Sheriff's Deputy Ray Land was first on the scene. And the guy told him to take the money. He said, I don't want it. He says, all I want to do, do is kill you people. I have to kill you. The boy asked him, said, you really mean that? He said, yes, I mean it. He says, uh, well, he said, if you're going to said, kill me first, because I can't stand to see the girl be stabbed. Brian is stabbed seven times as he lays on the ground with a punctured lung, slowly bleeding. The Zodiac moves to Cecilia, stabbing her ten times. Calmly, the man called the Zodiac walks away, disappearing into the woods. Real nice college kids just stabbed for no reason at all. I, I, I never witnessed anything like it before. Much like the previous attack, the young man, Brian Hartnell, survives. The young woman, Cecilia Shepard, does not. Brian is interviewed in his hospital bed as he recovers from the attack. He gives an amazingly detailed description of the killer. He had this black hood on, just little slits in the eyes, and where, you know, these clip-on glasses, they were clipped into those little uh, loops. He said, well, what I need right now is to get you tied up. As soon as he got us, of course, uh, Cecilia and I prayed that, you know, that whatever the Lord wished, that, uh, that we could be expedient and that, you know, we were, you know, willing to, to do whatever he had in mind. Never one for a lack of showmanship, the Zodiac leaves another strange message. This time, it is on the door of Brian's car. The message includes the dates of his last two attacks 
and the date of the stabbing that had just taken place. Really, everything about this killer is a mystery. I mean, it's, it's an enigma. There doesn't seem to be a motive. And without a motive, it's really hard sometimes to, to track somebody because you don't know where to start. The Trail of the Zodiac now crosses from the East Bay into the city of San Francisco. It is October 11th, 1969 the corner of Mason and Geary Streets. A man hails a taxi cab. He asked the driver to take him to Washington and Maple Streets in the Presidio Heights district of San Francisco. After riding just a few blocks on the way to the Presidio at the northern tip of the city of San Francisco, the cab driver, Paul Stein, pulls over to the side of the road. The passenger pulled a gun and fired at one time in the back of the head of Paul Stein and killed him instantly. Tracy Torme, a screenwriter living in Los Angeles, has studied the Zodiac extensively since the 1980s. So the kids who actually witnessed that murder, they were watching out the window, it was, right. they were on the terrace, kind of, it was a party, and all of a sudden, boom, they see, they see actually the Zodiac come out of the cab and wipe the side of the cab, I believe. These teenagers looked out the window and saw the murder. They called it in, and a police car stopped a big lumbering guy with glasses coming down the street a block away. But they asked this guy, have you seen anyone with a gun? He goes, oh, yeah, a guy went running that way, and they took off. Unfortunately, the teenagers thought they saw a black man. It wasn't a black man. He was maybe wearing a mask. Who knows? And because it was misreported, Zodiac later taunted the police with that and said, you stupid pigs. You walked right by me, and you asked me where I saw somebody. You're so dumb. And he loved to do that with the cops, to call them stupid. Um, that was the opportunity to catch the Zodiac. And it was missed. It was lost. On October 18, 1969, a police composite sketch based on the teenage witness's testimony and the encounter with the patrolman is made public. It is the only clue we have to the Zodiac's true appearance. A letter arrives at the Chronicle, and it started out, this is the Zodiac speaking. I'm the killer of the cab driver over at Washington Streets the other night. The administrative assistant opened this letter, and out fell a piece of blue and yellow checkered shirt with blood all over it. It had been torn off. Toward the end of the letter is the most serious threat yet. Zodiac th uh, threatened to uh, shoot the tires out of a school bus and, as he put it, pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. There's a lot of discussion about whether to print this letter and to what extent and how much it would engender fear or panic in the community. But uh, ultimately, they felt out of public safety's concern they they would do that. They had no reason not to take Zodiac at his word that he was going to potentially attack a school bus full of children. Terrified residents keep their children home from school. Those that do ride the bus are escorted by local police. Sargon Yosef, a writer from San Francisco, says it is ego that drives the Zodiac to make so many threats. What do you drives you to say that it was ego? I remember, my sister is older than me, I remember when they couldn't go out of the house, they were terrified. At six o'clock, the streets were dead. I mean, nobody went out. Here's one man, one pathetic man who did that. And people, even then, would say, oh, the Zodiac, he's, he's my neighbor down the street. Or who's that creepy teacher we have? He's, he must be the Zodiac. It was, you know, it was all over the place. It was interesting. It really stuck around in the air heavy. Everyone's sort of going to San Francisco to be free and peaceful and happy and be flower children and all that. And meanwhile, this guy's going around threatening to blow up school buses and watch the kiddies explode. He didn't know when he was going to strike, where he was going to strike, and he said he was going to strike. He scared the hell out of everyone here. The Bay Area is in a panic. Not even children are safe from the Zodiac Killer.
In the fall of 1969, the Zodiac Killer strikes fear in the San Francisco Bay Area by threatening to wipe out a school bus. After murdering a cab driver in San Francisco, the Zodiac has broken a pattern of attacking young couples. The police are convinced he is capable of following through with his threat. But by early November, despite similar threats, there is no attack on a school bus. The Zodiac case is gaining national media attention. The killer becomes a suspect in many unsolved Bay Area murder cases. And tips pour in from places as far away as Texas and Georgia. He was smart. Uh, he was bold. Uh, he was uh, brazen about the way he went about, about communicating with the media and subsequently the public. But he was shrewd. And of course, uh, we're talking about a period of time 40 plus years ago where the technology didn't exist that might have led to his capture today. You know, Zodiac went to a payphone to call the police to say, I, I just shot two people. We didn't have the ability to track that call. The real key to identifying Zodiac at that time was, was handwriting, the printing in the letters. In Sacramento, handwriting expert Nanette Bardo studies the letters of the Zodiac. She's surprised to find herself engulfed in the mystery that has become an obsession of so many others. Would you say that you can break the code of who the Zodiac is through the handwriting? If forensic science is correct and what we've been taught so far, absolutely, this should place the author just like fingerprints. And the handwriting cannot lie, so even if somebody was backing their suspicions by lies, I'd be able to detect that inside the handwriting. I do believe to a certain degree this individual was attempting to cover up some of his letters and his writing. However, we know that we all fall back in time to our natural uses. What, what do you mean by falling into natural uses? Can you please oh, give me yeah, a, explain absolutely. that to me? Let me take one of these letters that he started with here. This one, basically you can see at the beginning where he attempted to start writing like out of the school book perfect form, everything's nice and perfect. And then as you get down to the bottom, you see it start to begin to deteriorate and become more of a sloppy mess than the top was. Generally, when you start looking at um, for disguised writing, you start at the bottom of the letter instead of at the top because they're going to revert back to their subconscious ways once their hand gets tired and their head gets tired of thinking how to do this. By studying his writings and his actions, experts gain insight into the killer's possible motivations. Aphrodite Jones believes that one clue seems clear. The Zodiac appears to have a violent, angry tendency towards women. Did you ever do any research into the men, the young men who got away? There were a couple of guys that survived the, some of the early attempts. And I think that's because he didn't have the rage against men that he had against women. One of the profiles of him was that he had something against his mother and that he had some kind of weird kind of relationship going on there and he's sort of always trying to get back at his mother by killing all these women. Possible. In writing his screenplay, The Zodiac Returns, Sargon Yosef is able to piece together a mental picture of the killer. The Zodiac Returns was a fictional account of what if this monster yes. returned to the city of San Francisco. Correct. And for that, you really had to do a lot of research into the reality of the Zodiac. So you became kind of an expert, so to speak. Yeah, I didn't know until I started to research him how precise he was. It wasn't that he picked just the, the, the victims. It wasn't just like a random. It, it seemed like it was random, but he did follow a pattern. It's really disturbing to watch this man who was very intelligent. He was. This man wasn't about just attacking women, which was mostly his crimes. But if you dig deeper, it was ego. So you start to see the psychology of that. And his last killing is Paul Stein. He wanted to prove that he was a man. He killed him from behind in the cab. So he still couldn't face the man to kill a man directly. So he had that fear. So it was really his personality was about women turning him down. He didn't like the police. He didn't like authority. What was it that he was going after? Was he going after terrorizing a city? 
I think that he really enjoyed terrorizing the city. I think he was a tremendous egotist. He wanted to see his cryptograms in the newspaper. Egocentric and shrewd, a woman hater and terrorist. The Zodiac is a killer starving for attention. If he were around today, if he hears this, he's loving this. But by the mid-1970s, the Zodiac's trail is growing cold. He virtually stops all communication with the Chronicle. It wasn't until April of 1978 that he sent uh, his last letter to the Chronicle and said, I'm back. And at that time, I think he claimed he killed 37 people. The speculation was that perhaps he was in jail or prison for some other reason, uh, or he had left the country, or he was ill, or for, for whatever reason. But the Zodiac silence does not end the speculation. More than 30 years later, a revelation in the case is about to unfold, and it promises to be a bombshell. Dennis Kaufman believes his stepfather, Jack Torrance, is the notorious Northern California serial killer known as the Zodiac. Jack admitted to it in a tape-recorded interview with Dennis. And now Kaufman tries to prove that his stepfather was telling the truth. Can you show me what you consider to be the most compelling piece of evidence that your stepfather was the Zodiac. After I put the composites together, it was uncanny, the resemblance. Then I started taking some of the Zodiac letters and some of Jack's writing and finding the same words and putting them together. And you can see the similarities. The top lines are Zodiacs and the word line right beneath them are Jacks. Zodiacs, Jacks, Zodiac, Jack, all the way down. Dennis was very particular about how he described the handwriting of his stepfather, Jack, and the handwriting of the Zodiac, to the point that when I got to the handwriting analyst, I was ready to see what became an undeniable comparison between these two samples of writing. There are too many commonalities there for this not to be the same person. To prove his case, Kaufman delivers samples of his stepfather's writings to handwriting expert Nanette Bardo. She looks for telltale signs that could link Jack Torrance to the known letters of the Zodiac. A tick mark can be something that is executed on entrance stroke or on the exit stroke, and it's a leaving of ink that you wouldn't, it is not part of the actual letter itself. This is the kind of A I would write, mm -hmm. okay? I also write that type mm -hmm. of an A. It's either A like that or A like that. Okay, and name. here's your tick mark. There's my tick mark, that little thing that came yeah. off there. And if I saw an A, if I saw an A produced, in which case that tick mark wasn't connect, wasn't like that, yet every single well, one you do, again. I see it, then if that's missing, then I can't identify you as the author because that's missing. That's something you do all the time subconsciously. You still can't not do it, it's in there. Wow. There's a double line in there. These are the type of identifying factors that I'm looking for. It's not just a simple, did he make his F the same way? Is there tick marks at the top and the bottom of the S? So I can't help but do yeah. it now. Here, yeah, you I can't switched do it. it. No, I switched it. I know, it. to the inside, <laughs> but it's still there. <laughs> oh my goodness. See, the thing is, is that um, I might be able to place five or six of your habits in here, but that's not enough for me to say you're this, ra this author. I have 42 just on paper, let alone the other ones that I've found since I continued the investigation. Wait a minute, when you say you have 42, you have 42 identical marks between Jack Torrance and the Zodiac letters? Yes. There's nothing that I've looked for out of the Zodiac letters that I've not been able to find in Jack's writing. Nothing? Nothing. This was one of my very first finds in the initial 20 that I looked for. And the letter O was actually one of my favorites because right here you find an identical O. Flattened on the bottom side instead of rounded with that same hook that comes through. It's almost egg shaped instead of round like an O. Egg shaped, mm -hmm. okay, I'm seeing that now, I get it. Another thing that you're taught is you're not supposed to be able to find spacing between the letters identical between one person and the next. So if you go through here, these are all of the ones that I actually pulled out of Jack's writing. You can see where, you know, the P-R-O, stop, G, whiz, dumb, harass, meant, period, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, however you want to say that, because. And then you go down into the zodiacs, and you get pretty much the same thing, airplane. Mm-hmm. F, act, if. <laughs> Ask, id. Um, is some very, very unusual spacing habits there, but they both seem to like to break up their words. So now, what is your opinion of Dennis Kaufman? I think Dennis really, really does have the stepfather of the Zodiac Killer. The final piece of the puzzle, as far as Dennis Kaufman is concerned, is found inside a piece of equipment in Kaufman's storage room. For years, Kaufman has suspected that his stepfather, Jack Torrance, is the killer known as the Zodiac. What he finds in storage now convinces him beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had been living with the man who terrorized Northern California for more than 40 years. Tell me about when you found the mask and how it was that um, you came to have this speaker of Jack. Rex, I'm surprised I even still had the thing. But in 1990, and don't even ask me why I remember it, but I do remember it. Jack asked me about the thing. He said, if you ever get rid of that thing, you know, I want it. And I thought, I didn't think nothing of it at the time, you know what I mean? It's like, why would he want this? What would he do with it? But when I was cleaning out my stuff, that's when it clicked. I, I ran across it. I was like, you know what? It's like, why did Jack ask me about this thing? For some reason, I decided to take it apart. And then when I did, you saw what I found in it. I'm saying, when I, when I found that, my heart skipped a couple beats, let me tell you. Dennis discovers what seems to be the notorious Zodiac mask. Could it be the same one worn by the killer when he attacked Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard at Lake Berryessa? Kaufman turns the mask over to the FBI for testing. Aphrodite Jones learns that to date, the FBI has not released any details on what they have done with the mask. But for Kaufman, this is the Zodiac's version of a smoking gun. Do you think people don't want the case solved because it's more fun to have this mystery? Absolutely. As sick as it sounds, that's absolutely right. That's exactly a fact. They'd rather have a mystery there because a mystery is always funner. But you know, people forget one thing. There's innocent people that died and there's families out there that don't have resolution. So it's not just a mystery to them, it's real life. It's like a curse, man. It is a curse. It is. It's a, it's a serious curse, and people get they get sucked up into it. They don't even realize they're getting sucked up into it. You know, I've seen it happen, and it's still not over. It's close. It's close, man. It's got to be, because I can't take it much more. I really can't. You know, I just want it to end. I just want it to be over. According to the FBI and what they're telling us, that indeed they do match Jack Torrance's writing with the samples, known samples, of the Zodiac. If, in fact, they are able to make that announcement conclusively, there will be justice and conclusion for the victims, and I think Dennis Kaufman will finally be able to put his head on the pillow at night and rest, because this man has no peace. The curse of the Zodiac haunts even this seasoned crime writer in her investigation. Do people like Dennis Kaufman and Annette Bardo hold the key to bringing about justice to the families victimized by this serial killer? Anyone living here knows that until this mystery is solved, there is still a chance that he could strike and once again hold this storybook part of the country in the strangling clutches of the killer known as the Zodiac. Thank you.